Welcome back everyone to another Kerbal Space Program video and by extension another installment of Life on Lathe, the series in which I endeavour to colonise the blue pearl of the jewel system and unlock all of the mysteries that surround Lathe because Lathe doesn't make any sense. It's basically like a second Kerbin. It's got an oxygenated atmosphere, it's got liquid water on the surface. In fact, it is so habitable that jet that air breathing jet engines work within the atmosphere, and Kerbals can go as far as being able to remove their helmets and breathe the air without facing any dire consequences. Which, you know, in isolation, these statistics don't sound particularly remarkable, but you have to remember that like Lathe is so far away from the sun compared to Kerbin that if this were a real solar system, or you know, a solar system as we know it, like the Earth solar system, shouldn't make any sense, does Lathe, right? It should be much, much colder than it actually is. It should not have liquid water on its surface. It should not have the same atmosphere as Kerbin because its orbital positioning around the sun just wouldn't allow for that. So why do Lathe be how it be is my thesis statement for this series. In our story so far, the Kerbals have sent a quadcopter drone to survey the skies and land of Lathe. Following the mission there, we then sent a space station to low Lathe orbit. This space station, of course, being absolutely gigantic. It has lots and lots of fuel reserves to refuel other craft. It's got lots and lots of capacity for Kerbals with two gigantic rotating gravity rings. And the scientists on board that space station could begin an initial preliminary analysis of the moon beneath them. And their findings are that, yes, it is correct. The sea is, in is indeed made of liquid water, which doesn't make any sense. So we really need to prioritize exploring the oceans of Lathe uh, above all else in our initial steps to colonize the moon. So enter the subject matter of today's video, as you can see, I've been busy constructing it on screen before your eyes. It is our Lathe Ocean Base. The idea is this is going to land in the oceans of Lathe. I guess that didn't really need explaining, but as you may have seen from the little teaser clip at the very beginning, this is not a normal Kerbal Space Program ocean outpost that simply bobs along on the surface of water and is very much similar to a land base. This actually has the ability to submerge below the waves and survey the uh, the ground that lie well the seabed i guess i forgot the word seabed for a second there so that is what i'm doing here i'm constructing it now some of you may be wondering how i go i i got it i got it to sink because these parts that i'm placing are particularly buoyant they don't sink very well but you may have noticed a couple of things firstly there are some ore tanks forming the spine of the uh, the base and they have a very very low buoyancy so they will help us to sink but crucially you may have noticed the uh, the eight service modules that lie at the bottom of the base these are filled with uh, eight fuel tanks each and these fuel tanks are filled with fuel and these fuel tanks are not going to be used for their fuel resources they're there to add mass the idea is that the contents of those service bays will add enough mass to this craft to sink it now i know what you're thinking matt Fuel tanks in Kerbal Space Program are very, very buoyant. So, yes, they might be heavy because they're filled with fuel, but it doesn't matter because they're going to float. But there lies uh, something we can exploit. And that is the crude way in which Kerbal Space Program ex um, simulates buoyancy. Yes, if those fuel tanks were just there underneath the crew modules, we would, we would float. We would float very, very well. However, because they are inside a cargo bay something magical happens. You see, when stuff is inside a cargo bay, when the cargo bay doors are open, they will have buoyancy. It's like the cargo bay isn't there. So we can use that to float the base. However, when the cargo bay doors are shut, which is what they're, that's the state they're currently in, the fuel tanks retain their mass, but they lose their buoyancy. So the only buoyancy that the game calculates for is the service module itself. And, you know, the buoyancy of the service bay is greatly offset by the lack of a buoyancy of the eight fuel tanks inside. And there is 2,400 units of liquid fuel uh, in each service bay, which adds a huge amount of mass and it enables this base to easily sink. And they've got two stacks of service bays. A, I needed two stacks because that's how much mass was needed to get this thing to sink when I was doing tests. But another good thing about having two stacks like this is I can actually open and close 
each stack independently. I believe it's action group six to open and close the top uh, four service bays and action group seven to uh, open and close the bottom four service bays. So opening just one layer, let's say the top layer, will uh, reduce the buoyancy of the craft so it will sink a bit, but not completely. And then you know, opening both stacks will then cause the craft to sink. So we can kind of use this to our advantage by controlling our descent and ascent speed when we're, you know, sinking and indeed rising. If we're rising a bit too fast, we can quickly just close one layer of the uh, service bays and that will slow down the rate at which we're moving. But also uh, it enables Kerbals who are swimming around next to the base to get back on the base if they can't reach a ladder. If they can't reach a ladder, we'll simply sink the base a bit but not completely so the Kerbal could just swim up to the door and get in no problems. There's a lot of advantages to having these service bays arranged the way they are so we can open and close uh, uh, half each. Like we haven't got to, we're not just limited to closing or opening all of them at once. And obviously I don't really want to have to go about uh, right clicking and doing everything manually, like having to individually right click and open and close each separate service bay because A, this would be very boring and B, uh, it would create an imbalance as I was going through the process of opening and closing the service bay. So really action groups are definitely the way to go having action groups uh, the the, um, the cargo base open and close in symmetry is vital and it's nice that we can actually have the two action groups separate to open and close both the upper and lower sets of service bays but we are I, i'm continuing to waffle on about the construction of the surface base or the ocean base i should say the ocean base itself but we have actually got uh, a lot past that we're building the booster and you may have noticed i've already built the interplanetary transfer stage as well now um you know to the untrained eye, this setup that is in this gigantic rocket, and indeed the massive interplanetary stage as well, looks like it could be overkill for a payload of this size. Because it is, <laughs> in theory. The payload is relatively small, and the, co and the crew modules, they don't weigh that much. We shouldn't need a rocket of this magnitude. However, remember, those service bays need to be very, very heavy to enable the ocean base to sink and rise. Well, I guess they just need to be heavy to sink when I think about it. Um, which means that we have to have a very, very... We, we've got a lot, a very, very heavy payload to get into space, and then obviously a very, very heavy payload to move to lathe. So we need a pretty substantial booster, despite the payload itself not looking too big at first glance. Uh, but we've got our rocket there, so we've got the massive Saturn V parts that came with the Making History DLC, flanked by four of the mammoth parts, which, you know, were formerly the biggest parts in the game, so you can really tell just the scale of this craft here. And then I've, I've put some Life on Lathe flags on the side of the booster because, ah, makes it look nice, why not? And then we can crossfade to our launch. Now, I've already got ourselves at a dual transfer window, so it should be relatively easy to get to the green planet. Um, the dual, an optimal dual transfer window, for those that don't know, is that if you draw a line from Kerbin to the Sun to Joule, the angle that that line forms at the Sun should be about 100 degrees. But really, dual transfer windows, there's a lot of room for error because Joule's gravity well is just so massive. You only have to get kind of near the planet to get an encounter with it, so don't worry if you overshoot or undershoot by a, a couple of days. And uh, there goes our ascent. So I guess there's not much to talk about, although we're going to get a nice satisfying Korolev cross-esque separation of those side boosts in just a second. There they go. I love it. I love seeing like four-way detachments like that, with it, especially with a little Separon, Separatron SRBs as well. Really, it makes it look a little bit nicer. And yes, now it's just the boring part of coasting our way to orbit using that cluster of gigantic Mastodon engines. A lot of people always say, oh, you've got to use clusters of vectors to get the best you know, ships because vectors are the most powerful engine in the game and in fact they're not technically the most powerful engine in the game is the mammoth engine but i appreciate that the mammoth engine has a very awkward profile and you know it can't have anything stacked below it however the vector engine is actually not as powerful as the ones on screen here these are the mastodon engines mastodon engines whilst they do provide more thrust they do weigh a little bit more than vectors so they're not quite you know, super overpowered but they are still more powerful for uh, payloads like this. They are, of course, the analog in KSP. Well, they're the KSP analog of the mighty Saturn V F1 engines, because I guess these parts are designed to allow players to replicate Saturn V, so they need to be, they need to have equivalent parts. So we've got big Saturn V tanks, and we've got the Saturn V F1 engines, but they are long gone. Now we are firing up our cluster of four vector engines, and that seems like quite a lot for an upper stage, having vector engines powering it. But again, 
we've got a very, very heavy payload. We needed high thrust to weight ratio. Now, I did make a bit of a blunder here, guys. You may have noticed in the resource, in the resource panel at the top right-hand side of the screen, you'll notice our ore gauge uh, says zero. And I made a point earlier in the commentary of saying that I put lots of ore tanks in the ocean base to reduce its buoyancy because ore tanks, when they're filled with ore, aren't very buoyant. I just obviously forgot to fill them with ore. And this makes a lot of sense, actually, because when I actually did this mission and landed the ocean base in the ocean and pressed sink, it was much slower than it was during tests. And I think this might have been why. I think at some point, for some reason or somehow, I uh, got rid of the ore in the tank. So maybe I just never added it. Uh, but I definitely tested it with full ore tanks because I tried to see what would happen if I drained the ore tanks, like dumped their fuel. So I'm not really sure what happened. At what point in the in the build process, I either didn't add ore or deleted the ore. But it's all it doesn't matter because it doesn't it doesn't matter because the base still works as intended anyway. So now we are on the very boring, very slow nuclear engine stage. We only have six nuclear engines. I know only six engines, right? But the nuclear engines. They've got very, very low thrust to weight ratio, so uh, it's going to be very, very, it's going to be a very, very long bur burn process. Uh, their thrust to weight ratio is so bad, in fact, that I wanted to split our curb into lathe, lathe transfer burn over a few burns, uh, just so that we can maximise the amount of time we spend at Kerbin periapsis, which is when, which is the most efficient point in an orbit to do burns like this. Because of course we know about the Oberth effect, which states that burns like this are more efficient at periapsis when the ship is moving fastest uh, it's the, uh, your engine burns are more efficient basically and a more efficient burn is a shorter burn and given the fact that our burns are going to be very very long we want to reduce the length of those burns as much as possible so we can spend as much time as possible burning at periapsis hence we are, we're going to be doing lots of burns at Kerbin periapsis to get our way all the way to Jewel now we're going to do this burn here and then once we get just to the edge of Kerbin's sphere of influence. We're going to time warp up, but as we reach Apoapsis point, we're going to drop out of warp and point retrograde and actually lower our periapsis to be on a collision course with Kerbin. The reason for this is that now we can detach that pretty much empty lower fuel tank so that it won't get left in orbit. It'll crash back to Kerbin nicely, but now we've shed a lot of dry mass. We needed to save as much mass as possible because this craft is very, very heavy. So I thought it'd be a good way, like, maybe we can save a bit of fuel by having some of the empty fuel tanks detach once they've been expended. You know, once they've expended all of their fuel, at least. So that's why I did that just there. So we could dump some mass, gain a little bit of extra delta V, just ahead of our big burn that is going to get us from the Kerbin system all the way up to Jewel. It's not going to get us on a lathe encounter just yet. Uh, Jewel is on a different inclination to Kerbin around the sun, so we will need to do a mid-course cor correction burn for a couple of reasons. Firstly, as mentioned, to get our inclination on the same plane as Jewel, but more crucially, to get an encounter with Tylo. Yes, Tylo. Uh, so that we can do a gravity assist to get ourselves captured around Jewel for free. This thing, whilst it has a lot of delta V, is actually, uh, unbelievably, cutting it a little bit fine. Probably if I wanted to make things easier for myself, I would have added, a, I don't know, 500 or so extra meters per second of delta V to the transfer stage just here. We're going to have to get a little bit creative with doing some gravity assists from both Tylo and Lathe to reduce the cost of entering Lathe orbit. Because I didn't want to do any air braking, at least not for actually capturing around Lathe. I, I figured, you know, the head cannon of this is that this is actually quite a fragile base, right? It's designed to test lots of delicate scientific experiments. Uh, in the ocean, we probably don't want to be uh, doing big aero captures without uh, heat shields. And of course, you know, there are Kerbals on board. We'll make sure they stay nice and safe. So I thought it would probably be best if we did all of our captures around Lathe using the nuclear engines and... Uh, once we actually enter Lathe's atmosphere, we'll only be entering from low Lathe orbit, so the re-entry speed, or I guess entry speed, right, because we're not re-entering Lathe, are we? Uh, entry speed will be slow enough that uh, heating won't be an issue, so that's why I didn't bother adding heat shields to this craft. So there we are, we've got our Tylo gravity assist just here, and as you can see, just by playing around with the nodes, we can get a nice dual orbit for free. Uh, well, I guess it's not technically for free because we are doing a mid-course correction burn to get our Tylo encounter, but we need, we, we would be needing 
to do a mid-course correction burn anyway, and the extra delta V needed to just get ourselves on an incline on an on an encounter. I forgot the word just then for a second. To get ourselves on an encounter with Tylo, it's basically nothing. So that's what I'm doing here. Now I I am a bit wary that it was only last week when I did a mission to Jewel, and I already feel like I'm covering a lot of the same points. But it's I appreciate that there are people who have never seen any of my videos before, or at least at the very least didn't see last week's episode. And guys, you know, maybe you could consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss any more episodes in the future. That's right, what a plug. I mean, to be fair, I do look at my YouTube analytics and the majority of my viewers aren't subscribed to me. So I'm just saying, if you enjoy this video, leave a little like. It always, I really do appreciate the likes. They really do help the algorithm TM. But if you want to subscribe and enjoy, the, if you're enjoying this series and want to subscribe and see where it goes, all the twists and turns it takes, Buns just there. If you regret it, because you probably will, then uh, you can unsubscribe later. It's free. Doesn't cost anything. Gosh, I feel like such a shill right now. Anyway, let's move along. I, well, I, mean, I don't know. There's not much I can really talk about. I've already kind of established the stuff that I was doing. Although that did, I was starting a point where I was saying that I am a bit worried about rehashing the same topics over and over again in Life on Lathe because the missions are effectively always the same. We go from Kerbin to Lathe <laughs> and land on Lathe and establish some sort of surface base. So I think, I feel like the actual selling point of this series of videos is not necessarily the journey, but the destination, but more crucially, the vehicles themselves. Uh, I guess to be more specific than that, the actual craft that will end up at Lathe. So last week was the space station, The few a few weeks before that, it was the quadcopter. This week, it's the ocean base. I feel like you guys probably aren't here necessarily just for the actual journey to Jewel. But if you are, and you had questions about how I did the Tylo Gravity Assist, and, you know, Matt, can you do a tutorial on doing Tylo Gravity Assists like this, which is now currently underway, or I guess just Gravity Assists in general, you know, can you do a tutorial, can you give any tips, that sort of thing. And to be honest, I'm going to say the same thing I said last time, uh, I don't think that's the best way, uh, as in watching YouTube tutorials, is the best way of learning how to do Tylo Gravity Assists, and by extension, Gravity Assists in general. I hearken back to simpler times when I was a wee young rocket scientist who also did not know how to do Gravity Assists, and the way I learned how to do them, and you know, how to do captures around Joule, granted I did know that it was possible to capture around Joule using a Tylo Gravity Assist by just seeing people talk about it on Reddit. I didn't watch any tutorials, I didn't read any tutorials on how to do it. I basically just got myself on the way to Joule, and then during my mid-course correction burn, I was like, you know what, I've read about this, I'm gonna see if I can do it. So what I did was I got myself a Tylo encounter, and then just sat there for like, probably like half an hour, 40 minutes, just playing with the maneuver node, seeing what happened when I got my orbit in such and such a way. And you can kind of just get a knack and a feel for how encounters with planets and moons will influence your uh, eventual orbit. To do a Tylo gravity assist, just make sure that your periapsis around Joule is roughly the same height as Tylo's orbit. And then you want to make sure that you get a Tylo encounter before your Joule periapsis. Once you've done both of those things, it's then just a case of playing around with the maneuver node, getting it nice and close to Tylo, then you just zoom out and see how it influences your orbit around Joule. And then, you know, it doesn't take much then to just tweak individual nodes on the Maneuver Node Maker to get the actual orbit that you want. Uh, it will take you a while at first. You won't be able to get it as quickly as I did in this video if you've never done it before. But don't be disheartened because I cannot stress this enough. Once you get it once or twice, it'll just click. And then it'll be really easy and simple and intuitive. And it will be much easier going forward. One th <laughs> on the subject of gravity assists, you may have seen, I'm actually planning another one. We're on a very eccentric dual orbit, and we don't really have the delta V to get captured at Lathe right now. We haven't got enough left. So what I decided to do was I decided to lower my apoapsis around dual a little bit further by doing, well, I guess I did a, an, un an un unintentional uh, Tylo gravity assist just then, but more crucially, I wanted to do a Lathe gravity assist just so that uh, I could lower my, my apoapsis around dual whilst at the same time trying to keep my periapsis not too much lower than Lathe's orbit. You don't really want your periapsis to be too much lower lower than Lathe, because in order to get into an orbit around Lathe, your orbit has to be the same as Lathe, as in your orbit around Joule 
needs to be the same as Lathe's orbit around your your relative velocity to Lathe needs to be zero, at which point you will just be in a stable Lathe orbit. So by lowering your parapsis around Joule to lower length, lower than Lathe, you're going to have to end up undoing that and raising your Joule parapsis once you start your Lathe capture burn, or I guess your aero capture around Lathe if you're lazy. Like me, like like how I, I probably should have uh, added heat shields to this thing so I could do an aero capture around Joule and save a but an aero capture around Joule. Getting a bit ahead of myself. I'm getting a bit excited, guys. Uh, I should have added some heat shields so I could do an aero capture around Lathe. Save myself loads of headache. Save myself loads of fuel. But there is actually a pretty good reason why I didn't. I wanted to make sure... I wanted, Well, first of all, I wanted to have a bit more freedom in terms of where I was going to land. If I was doing air brakes, yeah, I could have controlled my angle of attack and influenced the amount of velocity I'd lose with each air brake pass, but it wouldn't have been as easy as just doing engine burns to get myself on a more precise orbit. I also wanted to make sure that I was going to be landing somewhere along the equator of Lathe, which again is possible to do by changing your angle of attack and, you know, aiming yourself better when you're doing aero captures, but it's just, I, I personally just find it easier to do things this way. So there we are. Rule of thumb, the more horseshoe shaped your encounter with a planet or moon is, the cheaper it'll be to capture. So as you can see, we've got a very nice U-shaped pass of lathe, which means it's going to be a relatively inexpensive burn to capture around the moon. So that's what we're going to do now. <laughs> we have now entered lathe's sphere of influence for the final time, for this video at least. Uh, so it's just going to be a case now of time warping down to our maneuver node and executing it. And again, we're still running on nuclear engine, so our thrust to weight ratio is not great. So I'm going to do the burn uh, over. I'm not. I'm not just going to do the capture in one burn. Well, actually, I guess the pedantics among you. Yes, I am doing the capture <laughs> in one burn, but I'm not going. For, I'm not trying to get my final orbit in one burn. I want my final orbits to be uh, circular, not eccentric, just to reduce our re-entry speed as much as possible. I said re-entry speed again, didn't I? I meant entry speed. Whatever, let's just move on. That's what I'm doing here, and I believe uh, I had to do an inclination change as well because uh, I didn't actually check to see if I was coming on an equatorial encounter, and I wasn't. So we're going to have to do a quick inclination change. And uh, inclination changes, like, you know, your tilts, your, um, what are they called again? Normal and anti-normal burns, they are cheaper at apoapsis. They're like the opposite of prograde burns because uh, you... The slower you're going, the cheaper inclination changes are going to be. So uh, you want your apoapsis to be nice and high when doing inclination changes like this. Or at the very least, you want to do the inclination change before you've lowered your apoapsis to its final height, which in this case is going to be fairly low. Although because I had to do an inclination change, uh, I didn't have enough fuel to get myself lowered into my final desired orbit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do burn as much as I can So we've just got a breath of liquid fuel left in our transfer stage and then we'll quickly warp up to apoapsis detach it so that it just crashes into the surface of lathe never to be seen again and then we can just do the final bits of our burn and ultimate lathe entry using those four vector engines those vector engines yeah they've got terrible delta v because they're very very powerful engines they haven't got very good isp at least you know compared to nuclear engines but they've got a couple of things going for them they're very high thrust which makes them great for landing heavy stuff like this payload and they've also got very very uh, high gimbal like they can tilt a lot they've got very very good thrust vectoring they've got a big range of they've got a big gimbal range that was the that was the sentence I was looking for as I struggled along that paragraph just then. They've got a big gimbal range, so it makes it easy to control uh, unbalanced payloads. Now, this payload isn't particularly imbalanced. You want it to be fairly well-centered, the center of mass, uh, so it doesn't tip over in the water. But, uh, I don't know, I just wanted to be prepared for every and any eventuality that we might have run into. And uh, there it is. It is now detached from that lower stage, so we can just try and get clear of it. <laughs> there we go. And then we can burn prograde. And uh, then I guess we can get ready to perform our lathe entry. So the first thing I wanted to do was just get into a stable orbit so that we can, you know, sit back, relax, have a nice sip of our whiskey, and uh, check out the land masses, see what would be a good place, see, uh, scout out a good landing site. Obviously, we have to land in the sea, so it's going to be fairly easy to find a landing site because Lathe is mostly sea, but I wanted it to be somewhat near lots of land mass because we're not just going to be doing this as our only surface base on Lathe. I want to do lots of surface 
modules and we want to do a, a colony on the land as well as in the water. So I want it to be relatively close to a land mass so that Kerbals could easily move between the two bases. This will of course mean that I'm going to have to introduce some sort of transport system as well. Uh, some sort of terrestrial seaplane I'm thinking or even a boat. Who knows, I haven't really thought that far ahead. But some sort of vehicle to get between the two bases. Travelling in Kerbal Space Program can be quite boring, so I don't want to have to be sitting there for like hours on end when moving Kerbals between the the, the various surface bases. So I thought, let's just like try and land this base close to land so that when we eventually put something on the land on Lathe, we'll just put it close to the ocean base. Uh, was my logic there, because you can get some pretty isolated areas of ocean on Lathe that are completely void of any land masses anywhere in sight. So, uh... So yes, that's what I was looking for there. Now I've deployed these uh, alligator hinges just here to add a bit of aerodynamic resistance because I realised that I'd actually gone for a, a quite a steep uh, lathe entry. I was like, oh yeah, actually this might have been a bit too steep. I might, I might be at risk of overheating. So I deployed the alligator hinges just there to increase our drag, slow ourselves down quick enough such that there wouldn't be enough time for the parts to succumb to overheating. And that... Time has now passed. We are now through the most dangerous part of this mission. Now we can allow the parachutes to deploy and decelerate us to safe landing speeds. Of course, they won't decelerate us completely. I cannot understate how big or how heavy this craft is. We can't really land on parachutes alone. We can do most of our slowing down with parachutes, but just before touchdown, what is happening here? It's... Uh, <laughs> spinning around a bit. Uh, once we get close to touchdown, we can quickly fire up the nuclear engines and kill the 15 or so meters per second remaining in our descent. And there we have it there. Now, those alligator hinges, I um, I don't think I ever mentioned what they were for in the video, but basically, once we sink down to the surface of Lathe, I thought it might be nice to have some sort of barrier between that glass cupola module underwater and indeed the seabed so that those um, alligator hinges will just serve as, uh, as, as landing legs basically. And there we are, we are splashed down on lathe. We can just separate those boosters now in a very, very safe maneuver, I think you can all agree. Uh, and there we have it, the surface base is done. Of course the video is not done yet, we still need to do the most exciting things um, that we have to do, and that is of course running all of our science experiments going on EVA taking crew reports and yes, of course, sinking this thing down to the seabed and seeing if we can learn anything about Lathe on its journey and I guess at its destination at the seabed. So, we have touched down in the sea. The question was, you know, how does the sea exist in the state it's in on a planet that would, that surely would be far too cold to facilitate the existence of liquid water. So, we're going to get a scientist Kerbal out on EVA. He's going to go to the external lab that's sitting on top of that hitchhiker storage module just there. After, of course, we've deployed the communications equipment to make sure we've definitely got a good signal to the orbiting space station and to the Kerbal Space Center as well. Then we can get our scientist out on an EVA and he can start running those experiments. Now, it might have been easier if he'd got out the other way. I clearly must have put that <laughs> must have put that module on upside down. Whoops, never mind. Top tip, guys. Always try and pick a flag that's got writing on it when you're... Or well, at least it's not symmetrical vertically when you're placing modules like that so you can make sure that you're placing them the right way around. For the labs, I put the Lown Aerospace insignia on them and when I first placed them, the Lown Aerospace flag was upside down. I could tell this because the, flag, the writing was upside down. Obviously, I didn't do the same sort of check for the Hitchhiker Storage Module. Whoops, you live and learn, don't you? So yeah, we're performing lots of science and I don't know, guys, it's all weird. It's all coming back telling us what we thought we already knew, you know? Yes, there's an oxygenated atmosphere. There is liquid water. And our scientist is doing some practical experimentation here by taking off his helmet and then diving headfirst into the ocean. Uh, I said he was a scientist. I never said he was smart. And then we can test out my other thing where I said, look, he can't actually get back to the door on that ladder. But after sinking down the base partially, he can then just jump into the sea and swim towards the, the hatch. And now I think it's time to get to the sinking of the base itself. So I found that uh, when it gets to this point, it doesn't always sink below the surface for some reason, but if you just activate physical time warp, it then just drops below the waves, no problem. And there we are. Now, I don't know how deep this particular area of the sea is. So we're going to have to all watch and see how deep this rabbit hole really goes. So our Kerbals are in good spirits. We've got our pilot here, I guess. 
Oh wow, look at that darkness looming ahead. I think we've got quite a long way down to go, guys. So we're cruising down at a steady 1.6 meters per second, which I think is a nice, safe uh, descent speed. I have sped the footage up for you guys. It's not quite as tedious as it was for me. When I was doing this, I didn't want to rush it too much because uh, I wanted to make sure I decelerated our descent as we neared the seabed so we didn't bounce into it too hard. And wow, things are getting very, very dark we are, as we approach the one kilometer below sea level mark. And there we are, blazing past it. And we are still, I can't see the bottom at all. Are we going to get to, oh wow, oh, I see something looming. And there we are, slamming safely into the into the into the seabed and there we have it now we're gonna have to do some more we're gonna have to do some very thorough analysis of the data we get here but wow look at that those floodlights there illuminating the vicinity as you can see it looks completely devoid of life there's no plants down here there's no vegetation i guess those are both synonyms aren't they there's no animals nothing it's completely dead and desolate i think it's time to do some practical analysis yes our scientist Kerbal he's done practical analysis you know hands-on analysis of the surface but he needs to figure out this stuff himself so he's going to go on an EVA and take a surface sample from the seabed and then he's going to try and plant a flag but oh who oh do oh guys look how scared he looks <laughs> it was at this point he realized that he had made a huge mistake. EVA report from Lathe Shallows. Not quite sure if that's an accurate description of our current location, but I guess our brave, dearly departed scientist, uh, he works in his own mysterious ways. He's decided to coin it Lathe's Shallows, it would seem. But now we must mount a rescue mission. We need to get back to him so we can get back onto the base because I don't know how well Kerbals can survive at this pressure. Clearly they can. They do have capacity to survive, but I don't want to put that to the test see a lot oh wow look at that just like fading out of the black okay here it comes grab on grab on oh he's just completely frozen in terror it is a pretty scary situation to be in to be fair but yeah like he i literally he wasn't responding to like wasd or anything like that so all i could do was coast this surface base back to the surface as quickly as possible as we approach as we approach our breach I'm just going to close uh, the lower set of uh, service bays uh, momentarily and intermittently just to make sure that we don't breach the surface too quickly. If we just had all the surface bays open the entire way up to the top, we would just breach the water like a whale and then slam back into the water at breakneck speed and uh, it would have destroyed things. So that's why I wanted to slow down our, acceler our, our ascent as we reach the surface. And here we are, reaching the surface once again. Oh, oh God. Guys, I'm so sorry. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It makes me, it makes me feel sad. Look out, I'm no, oh, never mind. Oh, okay. He smiled briefly as he breached the surface and now, I don't know, is he responding? Are you there? Dudney, Dudney coming. He's alive. He did it, guys. Oh, who's happy? I'm happy. I'm relieved also. You know, land aerospace, uh, we can't afford another lawsuit, quite frankly. Uh, we cut a lot of corners in uh, Velocity Lake's safety um, certificates, certificates, certificates for uh, our, obviously our theme park business. So uh, our space, our aerospace division, we can't really afford the lawsuit. But don't worry, he is back on the craft. So oh, we can uh, put the phone down to our lawyers. Their services are not needed this time, although they will remain uh, on my speed dial and uh, on my phone book. They are A A A A lawyers because of course. Uh, I need them fairly high at the top of my contacts list because loud airspace, we need them so frequently. Don't know really where I'm going with this joke, but uh, yes, we are back on this. We are back at the surface. We can open up those communications dishes, but then we can fade across to an alternate reality because I added a little safety feature to this thing. What if hypothetically this thing was sinking, but then the crew lost control of the buoyancy regulators? And by buoyancy regulators, I mean the cargo bay doors. They couldn't get them open. We want to have them, we want to have some sort of escape system so they can get back to the surface if the base itself can't ascend. So what I've got is I've got an abort button there and it will separate 
the uh, this little module here with three seats in it. That's the reason why we have three Kerbals on this thing, because the escape pod only has capacity for three seats. I couldn't be bothered to transfer all Kerbals into the escape pods. So I'm only doing this with our brave scientist, but I feel like he earned a break, you know? <laughs> like, he did have a pretty horrible experience on an EVA from the ocean bed, and then we can just decouple that lower stage. The reason why that remains attached is because, and I learned this after the fact, the lunar excursion module has very, very poor crash tolerance and if we just let if we just attached the pylon before breaching it would the whole thing would pop out of the water and then slam back down and destroy the uh, lunar excursion module so we leave the pylon attached and then flip it upside down so that breaks our fall back down to the water and that will stop things getting destroyed so that was the reasoning behind that but as you can see that's the surface space done guys we're gonna have to do some thorough analysis of the data we found before deciding on where we need to go next in terms of our lathe colonization effort we can zoom out and get a wonderful view of space as we fade across to an end screen on the left hand side is a link to the full life on lathe series if you'd like to watch more videos like this the right hand side is a video chosen for you by youtube's recommendation algorithm based on your viewing habits so i have no idea what it is there's a link to subscribe and check out patreon and look at my merchandise and instagram and twitter and all that good stuff in the descriptions guys thank you so much for watching my video and i hope you have an excellent day